Fitting uh, introduction to our, uh, our talk today about the universe built on math, big bang of numbers. I'm so excited to be here with you and I'll to talk about this. Uh, Manuel Surya, mathematician, novelist, um, so many things that I'm hoping to learn about from you. But my first question is, you've written books. I know mathematicians who are writers, who are authors but I don't know that any who are novelists, this is your first book about math. Like what was it that gave you this idea to write a book about math? Well, that's a good question. Um, so uh, the way it worked was I finished my, I guess three novels and then I said, okay, you know, I have, I have all this exposure that is uh, with the general uh, world, audiences that are not mathematicians. So wouldn't it be great if I actually did a little bit of public service almost and uh, pushed the math message out there. Uh, I wrote something that would be accessible and would be an outreach kind of project and wouldn't take much time. I, that was the main thing, you know, it would be a quickie. Um, and that was in 2012 or 13. So you can see that that last bit was a miscalculation. So this, this actually took the longest of any book that I've written. <laughs> Well, um, there are lots of books about math for you know, the general audience, popular math books. And it's tricky business, right? Because people have complicated relationships with math. You know, maybe people like us, we're very pro-math. So it's a positive part of our lives. Not true for everyone. Uh, people write math books maybe to try to show people how the geometry that they learned in schools all around them or how Maybe understanding probability and statistics can help them make better decisions. You had a slightly more ambitious goal. Your goal was to, with the reader, construct the universe using only mathematics. A little more ambitious right, so. than trying to get people to you know, have a better relationship. So what was it about that goal that really kind of sucked you in? Yeah, so, so you know, the, the, since I'm a storyteller, I was looking at a story. I wanted it to be a narrative. And uh, the traditional way that math books would have a narrative is to look at the history of mathematics. And there's some excellent books that have been written with that uh, kind of framework. Uh, maybe it's about a certain topic, but you know, you look at it historically. And my question was, is there another way to do it? And so uh, that's where you know, I started thinking, okay, can you really build up everything just using mathematics? And um, when, I, when I, I also remember, you know, this, this, this uh, scene right back from when I was a um, student in Bombay, which is now Mumbai, uh, and I was sitting in uh, an algebra class in college, and this professor of ours gave us this very famous saying which is uh, by Kronecker, and uh, the saying is that God gave us the integers, the whole numbers, and the rest all is the work of man, that humans then took that and then constructed all of mathematics from it. And then what he said is, actually, I can do better than that. I don't even need God. Uh, I can just start with nothing and make the integers as well. And he actually showed us this on, 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 uh, on the blackboard. It was, it was truly something that was amazing. It was almost like a religious experience, the closest I've been to one, I guess. Um, but really, suddenly, all these numbers were flowing out of what he had done. It was like the walls were disappearing, and you know, the roof was gone, and it was like a big universe of numbers. And I think back then was this, just this, this point was where I switched. The this, this same professor made me switch from physics to math, and so I became a math major. And so maybe that's been lurking around in my mind as, you know, can you have a Big Bang kind of uh, thing with numbers? Can, can you explain existence based on numbers, on mathematics? 
Uh, so that's what I've tried to do in this book. So that's where the big bang of numbers was born. It was in that, that math class? Yeah, exactly. And yeah, this is, you know, it's a simple construction, uh, but essentially you start building, you start with, with nothing, which is, which is what, what, what we equate to zero essentially. Uh, and then from that you can create one and two and three and basically get all the numbers. Uh, so, so the question is then can you go any further? Uh, and uh, one of the things I did in this book was, uh, it was originally a novel. And uh, I had, I decided, okay, I'm gonna make the numbers alive. They're gonna be personalities. <laughs> They're gonna be, you know, little critters that are running around. After all, you have this universe that has just started. So these numbers are gonna be the only inhabitants of the universe. Um, so I wrote this, this whole book as a novel first. Uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, my, editor did not like it <laughs> <laughs> and she said that hey you know people who read math books are not going to read a novel and I said well let me let me try it out with some people and some people really liked it uh, there's a famous mathematician whose name I will not tell you uh, but I sent it to him and he said uh, the only two things I don't like about this book uh, the the it was called the godfather of numbers he said, the two things I don't like about this book, one is the title, uh, and, the, and the other one is the story. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, you know, maybe it was time to, to go back to the editing board. Well, it's interesting, you know, uh, in reading this book, uh, so it's a beautiful book. Um, I, I brought my copy so I can get it autographed and, later. And, and it's not a novel anymore, so, you know, <laughs> that person, if he's there in the audience, you know, I've changed it. So. But I would say that, you know, in, in reading this book, so uh, there were a lot of ways, I appreciated this book on a lot of different levels. Um, you know, I read a lot of popular math books and math books as well. I think one of the things that makes this book unique is that it really is a story. And so I would, in opposition to this uh, famous mathematician, I would say that you know, the, the story really comes out and it really drives the development of, of all the mathematics. And you, know, you talk about the, the, the numbers having personalities. The, 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 the math is, there are mathematical characters in this book, right? Zero is a character, one is a character, I, the imaginary unit is a character. You, you give them personalities. Like where, where did that come from? So uh, I think some of it actually came from a student that I had uh, in, in a first year seminar. I was teaching this and um, she, she had a, uh, I don't know if people here are familiar with synesthesia, where you actually have uh, colors that you see with numbers and so on. She actually had a different kind where she actually thought of numbers as people. So she had a little family of numbers where uh, one was a uh, you know a little guy, and then two was his older sister, and three was the mommy, and so on. She had, she had a whole family, and it went up to nine or something. Uh, but that's maybe where this started, uh, trying to Im imbue these numbers with some sort of personalities. Um, and it was very interesting because she also had colors associated with each number, and she told me, you know, uh, Dr. Suri, when you when you use orange for four. I, I just feel like screaming, because <laughs> orange is blue. And, and so, you know, I was very careful after that not to use it, unless I wanted to torture her, then I would start <laughs> mixing up the colors. But, but, but that's where that first came into my head. And uh, I think I managed to keep some of that in this book. So my editor, you know, I was able to slip it past her. Yeah, so, so the, I mean, there are these these characters, there's a story. You give, uh, n nature also has a lot of personality in your story. You know, it's interesting, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was the, the, the book takes a turn into physics at some point because, you know, we're not, when, when he, Mendel says he's constructing the universe, it's not just the mathematical universe, you're constructing the physical universe using math. And so there has to be kind of a physical mm -hmm. turn in there. And I was. Curious to know where your interest in physics came from. Obviously, I guess you, you say this math teacher turned you from physicist to mathematician long ago, but could you talk a little bit about the personality of, of nature yes. as well? Yeah, yeah. So, so here's the way the book works. You know, first, first is these numbers that, that come out of nothing, and then uh, you form different kinds of numbers. 
You, then, you, then you form geometry, which is very interesting, uh, just because if you, and, and I keep comparing this to religious uh, beliefs and religious constructions of the universe. So in, in, in most uh, theological constructions, you always assume that empty space is already there. You know, like God creates the universe, Brahma blows out the universe, so on and so forth. But there's always some sort of matrix of points, perhaps, where all these creations can be put in. Um, and then, and so that, that part, I think mathematicians, we, we can uh, do more with that. We can actually say how this empty space comes about. So that's, that's like the second part of the book. And then after I'd created empty space, then I had a problem. And that is that mathematics can do wonders with the abstract, with plans, with detailed schemes. But how do you use mathematics to actually create something that is tangible? Like even the humblest particle, mathematics alone, you won't be able to do it. And so I had to figure out a way to bridge that gap and the way I decided on doing that was to introduce this entity called nature. And the way I think of it, about it is um, just like when you have a house, uh, you make the plans, you hire somebody to make the plans, but then it's a contractor who actually translates that into reality. So that's the way that I started thinking of nature, that nature is the, is the force or entity or whatever you want to call it, that translates mathematical designs into physical reality. And we aren't really going to go into that, how that mechanism is, because this is a book that's based on mathematics, but um, that's, that's where nature comes in. And, and nature as a contractor is lazy. Well, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and nature is also, uh, you know, if you've ever tried to get anything done uh, with a contractor, like getting a house done or even a bathroom redone, you'll know that there are always these little errors that creep in. And so nature is, first of all, uh, wants to minimize her effort. Uh, secondly, she's going to do things at random, and she's going to maybe put her print on things, her watermark on things. And so there's a lot of randomness and errors that you see in the world, and that is basically nature being idiosyncratic. And yet mathematics allows us to work with those idiosyncrasies towards some kind of design. Exactly, and that's, that's, that's one of the you know, very basic questions about mathematics. Um, is mathematics something that you know, just describes the universe? Like, is it... Is it something that's uncanny in terms of how well it can actually describe everything, physical phenomena and so on? Or is mathematics a little more than that? Could mathematics be some sort of intrinsic force that actually drives the universe? You know, that actually is behind things. So in this reversed view, rather than mathematics forming a model and describing nature and describing uh, the world, it's the other way around. So the mathematics is the first, is the primal uh, force, and, and the universe that we see is actually an approximation of that mathematics. It's a physical manifestation of that mathematics. And this reversal is kind of interesting because it allows you to do a lot of neat things, gives you a different perspective, and uh, allows you to think about our world in a very different way. And one of the things I really liked was how you, I think, presented mathematics in these different ways. Like, certainly there's abstraction, uh, but there's also this idea of tinkering, of playing around with mathematics. And, you know, as a, as a math teacher myself, uh, you know, I'm on day five of our school year, and one of the things I'm trying to do early on with my students is to get them to play around with ideas, to explore and to make conjectures. And, you know, I think, in this book, you are presenting these different sort of facets of mathematics. And I, that must have been one of your goals, I guess, in, in doing this public service, in writing this very short book that you were uh, you know, going to do. Right, yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's one of the key things uh, in uh, math education, that unless you actually play with it, and you have to use that word play, and it has to feel like play, you're probably not gonna get 
as involved with it as you should or as you might be able to otherwise. And I think, uh, I think both you and I probably are aware as math teachers about how, how difficult it can be to get people motivated about it. Uh, but if you catch students early enough and you include a lot of this play aspect, which is what math is and which is what I try to bring out in this book, then uh, that can make a real difference. And, it's, and one aspect is, of course, to play with it in your mind, but also tactile stuff. So uh, one of the nice things in, that I was able to put in this book was uh, how you can describe geometry in terms of crocheting. I don't know if anyone in the audience crochets. Uh, yeah, so there are some of you there. But uh, it's, it's very interesting. Imagine that you're trying to crochet a plane, you know, just a plane. And you, you can draw, you can, you can make circles, you can, you can uh, crochet one circle after another and expand it out. And if you keep doing that, you'll get a flat plane. Now if you go to crocheting websites, you'll see that uh, they talk about some things that can go wrong with it. And the first thing that can go wrong is, as you're crocheting, you're putting in too little material. If you put in too little material, rather than staying flat, this, this thing is going to start curving like this. And if you keep going and you do it the right way, you'll get a sphere. And that's actually an alternative geometry. It's a curved geometry uh, that is different from the flat geometry of a plane. But there's something else, too. Uh, these same crocheting websites will also talk about another effect called curling or ruffling. And that happens when you add too much material in. So if you start adding too much material, where is this material going to go? It's not going to be able to stay flat anymore. So what happens is that the edges of your little patch start ruffling. And you start getting these waves along the edges. And if you keep doing that, you get this entirely new geometry called hyperbolic geometry. And uh, these, these things were you know, mathematically looked at by mathematicians in the 19th century or something, and on purely abstract uh, means, but uh, 50, 60, 70 years later, uh, this is what Einstein used in terms of explaining relativity and in terms of explaining gravitation. He talked about the curvature of space-time. So this is, this is one of the mysteries of mathematics. You know, very abstract stuff can lead to uh, really concrete uh, applications. So again, the reason I tie this into what you were saying is that uh, in classes, when I've talked about this, I teach uh, a kind of seminar on this, and a couple of the kids were crocheting, and they actually started making these hyperbolic surfaces. And one of them came up with a neat thing, and that was tic-tac-toe on this hyperbolic surface. And that, that's a great thing, and I, I have to put it on the website somewhere. But notice there's extra material, so there's some extra squares in there, and that suddenly makes you know, everyone is bored with a three by three uh, tic-tac-toe game, but with this, it becomes exciting again. So, you know, it's that kind of play that, that can be really helpful. Yeah, I, I certainly you know, work for that sort of sense of play in, in class, and, and something that you know, I'm thinking about, having read this book, is the role of story as well in helping people understand things and learn things and making those ideas. Stick and and you know we're talking about chapter two. We'll we'll just go through the days really quick. So there are seven days of creation. Right. Uh, day one is arithmetic. We create the numbers. Day two geometry. We talk about this. Uh, day three is algebra. Mm -hmm. um, algebra apparently spoke to you. Uh, perhaps you can tell us and, and, what it said. Yeah, and algebra is actually uh, you know, remember this was where I had to get nature. Well, how are you going to communicate with nature? And that's where you need algebra because that's the kind of a basic way that you can actually talk to nature. So that's, that's day three. Yeah, and algebra, of course, is the, the way to, to find, explore, and exploit structure. And that's, yeah, that's exactly, those are the rules the lazy contractor of nature right. will use to build the universe. Uh, patterns, uh, physics, infinity, and then finally, emergence. Maybe we can, we can pick one of those you'd like to talk about. Uh, but, but just to, to wrap up geometry, another thing I really, like about the book is that you know you give the sense of play the sense of you know you you have this 
uh, I guess, metaphor for exploring the plane, that you, you're lighting up points in the plane that satisfy some condition to mm -hmm. create circles and lines and things like that. So it's, it's this, yeah, this interactive sense of play. But you also touch on some, some real philosophical issues, both in mathematics and I think in, in nature as well. Like, what is the true geometry of the universe? You know, you, you just described that there are these different possibilities. And, and you know, you, you handle this in the book in a way that I think respects both the reader as someone who would like to learn more about this, but also the, the mathematics. And, and I, how, how, like, when you approach an idea as complicated as that, like, how, what are you thinking as a writer to, to do justice to both the ideas and, but also to present them to the reader in a way that's accessible? Yeah, so that's, that's always the big question. You know, how do you make these ideas accessible? And um, especially I think of my editor who is not a mathematician and who is, you know, basically a novelist and a poet. And I needed to make a book that she would be able to get into and that she would be able to understand. And so the first thing to go are uh, most equations and formulas. Uh, there's, there's, some, there's someone who said that each time you, it was about exhibitions, I think, at museums. Uh, the saying is that each time you put a formula in an exhibit, you lose half the audience. Uh, so, so that was, you know, there are a few, but you have to be very careful. Use them very, uh, with great thrift. Um, the, the other thing is really, I think what happens with mathematics is that people can interpret uh, a very simple uh, instruction or a very simple idea in many different ways. And you kind of, as an author, and I think this happens with uh, writing as well, because remember, I've written three books on India, which is uh, often hard to explain as well in some ways. Um, so what I always thought of was, OK, if I'm the reader and I see this, how may I misinterpret this? What are the different ways my mind might go? Um, and you know, I, would, I would actually get the wrong message. So it's, it's by thinking that way that I think you can then eliminate or refine some of the language and kind of channel people to think in a different way. The other thing that I'm a big believer of is illustrations. And so I think this book has about 300 pictures in it, uh, which, which again make make some of these ideas much more easy to uh, assimilate, I think. But a um, question that I think you'll, I guess everyone would want to know is, uh, since this book has been out, uh, have people been able to understand it or not? Right? So, Did you hear from that mathematician? Uh, no, he would probably understand it, <laughs> but uh, I didn't hear from that person. Um, I think the first thing that you need for reading this book is an actual interest in mathematics or in knowing more about, you know, this is, this is a great intellectual kind of pursuit that, has, that mankind has done. And um, when I used to go to writing colonies and so on, I would meet artists and writers and they would always say things like, often say things like, hey, I used to be good at math, but then after school I never had a chance to do it anymore and I'm curious about it. And they would ask me to actually give them a little math talk, and that's what I would do. I was kind of hurt because I would rather have talked about that novel, but they weren't <laughs> very interested in that. Uh, so, so I'm keeping that, those kinds of people in mind in terms of you know, figuring out how to, how to proceed. So anyway, interest is key. Um, I was giving a talk once uh, at, at my university about infinity, and there was this English professor sitting at the back um, and afterwards, people had to just fill out a form and tell me what they thought about the talk. And it was, it was again, with some students that we were giving this talk. So uh, the English professor wrote, I can't for the world of me imagine why anyone would spend their life thinking about these questions. <laughs> and first I thought, hey, that's pretty snarky. <laughs> but then I realized she was just being honest. You know, and one of the things I say in this book is I don't like cricket, and I don't hate me for that. Uh, <laughs> but you know, you have to have the interest. So I think that's the first thing, and the second thing for people who are not necessarily mathematicians is to take you know small doses because even though there's no equations, even though there's no formulas, these ideas are things that take a while to assimilate. You just need them. You need to go in your, in, at your own pace. So with that, uh, I do have a couple of friends who have read this book and uh, 
have, have actually done the whole thing. Um, did you give them like, a test? I did not. That they really I got did it? not. But uh, I, I, you know, I, I believe that they really uh, enjoyed it. And then I have people who also said, "Hey, you know, I read the first two sections or three sections, or I read the first ten pages and decided that you know this is not something I want to do." So it depends on uh, these two things: your interest and and that's that that gets down to. You know, as school teachers or as, as teachers, um, how do you create that interest in students? And I think without that interest, it's going to be a very hard journey. So again, I would, I would just tell people who are teachers, you have to find ways to make this stuff interesting. Well, I would say uh, I, I started reading um, your first novel, The Death of Shiva. Death uh, of Vishnu. Of oh, Vishnu, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry, Death okay. of Vishnu. Um, well, this is actually related to my question. As you can tell, I do not pick up on all the cultural references of uh, uh, India. Right. And um, one thing I noticed was that as I was reading uh, your book, like, even though I couldn't pick up on all of those details, it didn't prevent me from getting a sense of the story and understanding the story. And I think the same is true of you know, the big bag of numbers. Like, even if someone reading it on that first you know, pass, doesn't pick up on all of these little details of, uh, you know, this technical term or that. The story will, you know, continue to bring them through, and then on that second pass or third, you know, it'll make even more sense. So, um, you know, it's interesting, you're talking about who the, the book was for just now, and there's one person in particular that this book is for, and this may be, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, this may be the first book ever written because the author was jealous of the Pope's popularity. <laughs> okay, well that is true. Uh, so, so what happened was that um, uh, this book also started from this uh, New York Times op-ed that I wrote many years ago. Uh, it was called How to Fall in Love with Math. And the whole purpose, the whole thrust of this op-ed was that Mathematics is not just about formulas, about equations, about getting the right answer. It's really about ideas. And um, you know, it, it, it did very well, lots of nice responses. And the, the New York Times used to have a uh, most emailed of the day list. And this article quickly climbed up that and was number one for the day. And then they also have a most emailed for the week list. And so it started climbing that list, and by Friday it was like number three or so, and Saturday it was number two, and I was just getting ready to, you know, accept being number one, <laughs> have this wonderful feeling come over me, when the Pope started making these controversial <laughs> kind of statements about abortion and homosexuality and this and that, he literally came running behind me and bounded above and jumped <laughs> and took my number one spot. So, uh, so I was, you know, a little miffed, okay? <laughs> I'll admit it, but you know, okay, he is the Pope, so uh, I, didn't, I didn't keep my anger for very long. I even wrote in the book that once it's done, I'm gonna send it to him. Uh, he actually became a character in the book. And the reason for that is that he actually, if you look at his history, he, he was a chemistry uh, ma major in school, and he actually worked at a chemical lab as well. So he knows some science, and so uh, whenever I was looking at it, religion versus math, I, I used him as a uh, as someone to you know bring out the other side. Um, so I, you're probably wondering if I did send it to him, and I did. I did send the book to the Vatican, uh, and I got a reply back. And I was very scared to open it because I thought, you know, is this from the Pope's lawyer? That, you know, how dare you use His Holiness in, uh, in your book? And luckily it wasn't. It was from some other representative. And I was told that uh, he has read the book, supposedly, or he has received it, and it is in his thoughts and blessings. So, so very relieved. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, you were talking a little bit about you know, meeting, I guess, artists and other writers mm -hmm. and how they were interested in mostly in math and not so much in your novels. Uh, that evolved, right? Like, in the book you mentioned, I guess I'm not giving anything away, that you were carrying around a PowerPoint 
on a flash drive so that you go to these dinner parties and kind of be like, hey, anyone want to learn about infinity tonight? <laughs> want to see some dirty pictures? <laughs> <laughs> Math pictures? So, so tell, like, what were, those, what were those dinner parties like where you're, uh, did people leave? Um, no, because I hadn't served them food yet, so <laughs> <laughs> I know a trick or two. So. Um, but a few times, you know, I, I mean, a couple of times, um, like, parents had to rescue their children. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was really like I'd, I had to give this. It was, it was uh, so it's good that I've, read the, that I've written this book because I now have a, you know, wider audience. Uh, <laughs> but it was, a, it was something that... Sometimes you reach a stage in your life when you find something that just gives you this great joy. And uh, it was a way of sharing that, that I was carrying this around and uh, you know, sharing it with people. Because it's like, look at this, isn't this wonderful? And, and, and often, you know, this, was, this was filled with like animations like the one you saw. So it was actually entertaining and uh, children whose parents let them stay actually enjoyed it. So. <laughs> You describe yourself as a, a kind of Florence Nightingale, ministering math to the yeah, mathless. Yes. And, yes, and Johnny Appleseed, you know, throwing little seeds of math to the, <laughs> to the mathless, yes. What, uh, I mean, what, what are your hopes? Like if, if someone, someone reading this book, what, what is one thing you would hope they would take away from it? Uh, well, uh, I think just the fact that math is, uh, you know, I want them, I want people to have a good, uh, even if you don't, if you're not a mathematician, if you're not good at math, I want people to have a good impression about math. Because I think math has, uh, you know, you, you keep hearing, I hate math, and this and that. And I think there are different types of math. So it's to expand that idea of math. It's not about getting the right answer. Uh, it is something that is obviously, everyone agrees that it's essential and all that, and it's everywhere. But beyond that, to really take to heart that this is something that we all share, whether we like it or not. It is what's running our universe, and we should have a positive attitude to it. And that's really important. Again, I'm thinking about the kids whose parents tell them, uh, you know, have negative uh, ideas about math. I have to say, my own mother once said to me when I was in the seventh or eighth grade, don't take math. You know, it gets very difficult as you go up. <laughs> so, Just uh, become a novelist? Yeah, yeah. That was well, the advice. Like but, but so that's, that's the main thing, you know, just, just get a positive view of math. If, uh, if, if I can ask about it, being a novelist, like what, so being a mathematician is not a part-time job. You know, mm -hmm. it's like a, it's a, it's a way of life. You know, you, you're thinking about hard problems all the time. Um, what drives you to do this completely, what, what I mean most people might see is like this completely separate thing of being, a writer of fiction. Like, what drives you to do it? How do you do it? Where do you find the time? Let me let me take notes because okay, uh, yeah, I'd right. like to know. Um, well, I'm I, I'm not a good person to emulate because, like, the second book, uh, I I counted the number of words that I was writing per day that made it to the final book, and it was 58. <laughs> so over years and years, it was actually 58.7. So it's a little better. <laughs> um, but, but in terms of what drives me, what drove me was that I had started as a professor at uh, my university. And uh, I was told that, hey, um, you need to just do mathematics, make sure you have your nose in the books. And I wanted something else. I wanted another dimension to my life. And so I would go all the way from Baltimore to Washington, and that's where I would be in a writing group. And uh, I didn't tell anyone about this. I wanted to get tenure. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to be not taken seriously. Um, and that's what finally led to this book. So. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. If there are questions from people in the audience, uh, that would be, be great. I have a ton of questions that I'm happy to ask. Now, there, are seven, there are seven days of creation. We've got them all covered. Oh, it's working. It's on. Music has long been referenced as mathematical, and it's also considered probably the oldest form of 
communication between human beings. Um, increasingly, um, architecture, which has been termed frozen music, is dependent upon mathematic of, con of constructing algorithms. Um, and I'm wondering if either or, or both of these, um, music and architecture, um, are spoken about in your not novel. <laughs> hmm. Well, uh, not as a central theme, uh, just because I think, I think maybe architecture in a little bit in terms of design uh, and design, construction. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the idea of patterns, you know, that's, so I think when you abstract music, what is at the basis of it are patterns. And uh, certainly there's a whole day of patterns. So I think it's, the, it's at that abs more abstract level. Perfect, that's day four. All right, we yeah, right, three right, more. Right, yeah. <laughs> Anyone have a question about physics? <laughs> Richard Feynman apparently said, calculus is the language of the gods. <laughs> okay. The gods speak to us in calculus. What is the role calculus plays in creating the universe, you think? So um, when I first wrote that novel, uh, one thing I didn't mention why perhaps my, my uh, editor was a little upset was that it was actually like almost 600 pages. <laughs> so that actually had calculus in it. <laughs> um, but at some point, I had to get rid of it. Uh, Calculus is day eight. Day eight, gotcha. right, right. <laughs> so I think, I think that's going to have to wait for the sequel. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I have some material already. So. Any questions? Yeah, my name is Prabhakaran. I also started as a mathematician because in the 1960s, in India, when I was an undergraduate student, we were told that if you don't want to become an engineer or a doctor, you're good for nothing. So between the two, I thought I had some inclination for uh, engineering, mathematics, and science. So I took mathematics major and physics minor. But by the time I completed bachelor's degree, I lost interest in that. And it came out with a passing grade. As a result, I could not become an engineer. Then I started wandering around India, reached Bombay, and ended up in the Bharati Vidya Bhavan. There, on that particular day, there was admission going on, registration going on for various courses. And one line I saw, applicants of one, in one line, was the longest, and it also had very attractive girls from all over India. So. I went there to meet my friend who was in the registrar's office. I asked my friend, what is that line about? He said, that is for journalism course. I said, give me an application. So I enrolled for the journalism course. OK, I can, became, we, can we get to the question? Yeah, I became, <laughs> sorry, I uh, became an accidental journalist. We only have a few minutes, so quick question. Yeah, question. Accidental journalist, and I regret to say that I lost interest in mathematics, though okay. in the beginning, I was a good student. It was Bertrand Russell who brought me back, brought back my interest in mathematics. Okay, yeah. okay, let's, 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 I mean, your, your experience is one of the ones that I was talking about with, with some of the friends that I've, uh, you know, have strayed in some sense. And uh, mathematics is always willing to get you back, so come home to us. So that's, that's what I'll say. Okay, other questions? I'm sorry you haven't persuaded me to read the book because math has never been my home, but I do have a question about your writing group. Okay. Um, tell me more about how this writing group worked and how it influenced you to write this, not novel. Oh, well, the writing group was actually before my first novel. So that was for the death of Vishnu. And uh, it was very interesting because I went to several writing groups and at one point, uh, I found that, you know, when I started The Death of Vishnu, people were, uh, you had to write, read it out to, to this audience, and people had all these questions about, you know, wh who is Vishnu, where are we, this, that. 
And somehow, at that point, I knew that I'd, I needed a, something, a different writing group. Because you, you kind of, each writing group gave you something, but then you kind of graduated out of it. Uh, so if, uh, if any of you are writers, I think uh, that's one way of looking at it. I, in terms of my writing career, I, I actually took a few classes. Uh, but they were very short classes, and that, that was the only formal training I had. The writing groups were a lot of help, but I found that you know, going to different ones helped. Um, so in your opinion, what do you think, in order to like kind of carry on that task of making math less intimidating to people who want to grow up being a mathematician, what do you think, uh, what future literatures or medias do you think math would excel most to be like presented in? Like what forms of media and literature do you think? Um, I don't know. What, what do you suggest to students? You know, I think uh, such, Huge strides have been made in visualization tools, mm -hmm. like in the last 10 or 15 years, in terms of being able to, you know, you talked about the role of illustrations in the book, of course, like being able to build interactive, dynamic visualizations of mathematical concepts has made a huge difference in not just learning, but in teaching mathematics. Because, you know, you create these situations, people can interact with them, they can see the consequences of changes. You, know, you talk a lot about like emergence and about the iterative process of building, and you can see all of that sort of unfold. You can see the universe unfold in just a few moments, right? And then you can change the parameters and see a different universe unfold. Right. So you know, I think we've seen a revolution in uh, visualization and in videos. Like uh, you know, there are uh, YouTube uh, content creators who just do incredible work bringing complicated mathematical ideas broad audiences. Right, and I, I think I've been, and I'm sure you have been too, but there's a, a lot of stuff on the web that is, that will actually do computations for you. And rather than uh, some, some formula that is very hard to get into, uh, you can actually play around with it. It's almost like a lab, but a computer lab that you're basically using the calculations that are done automatically, so you don't have to do that grinding kind of calcula calculation. You can play, and you can, you can play see what happens. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So there was a question here. One of my students wanted to ask you if math was invented or discovered. That's, ah. a, that's a question that mathematicians often get asked. I told my student to read your book. Yeah, I, I like <laughs> to say that it was you know, not discovered or invented, but disvented. <laughs> Usually it works. I just make a quick exit after that. <laughs> All right, so um, quick, quick shout out to Patrick. Um, you know, I attended, and, and he, uh, you spoke about making it interactive and fun. Uh, many years ago, I attended something with Mark Saul. Uh, it was teacher training uh, that you had also done some classes with. And Patrick, uh, I, th I think you, one of the examples was GeoGebra. It's a software yeah. which gives you. So things like that. Um, so I, 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 I would really love for you, Manil, to write more books. I look forward to reading novels with math characters, math stories. Um, if you're all wondering what my background is, because I'm Definitely did not, I'm not a mathematician, but I did do under, undergrad in mathematics. But uh, one of the things I'd like to share is that the real fun in math starts once you're done with 12th grade, once you actually start doing pure math. And maybe your books could address those topics, you know, number theory, something else. Um, it could be, I, I think people relate to that a lot but on an intuitive level, even if we don't understand the the nitty gritty. So definitely would love to see more of, you know, read more of your work uh, on that. And on the calculus, I agree, keep it for later. Because okay. yeah, okay. I think Thank the you. continuous that all that stuff is really what drives people away. The moment you start putting a so, DY so what, by DX, Elsa. you lost your audience. Thanks again. So this is if actually I may, a, if great. I may slip in a question, I wonder what kind of a role you assigned to this 
strange bunch of fellows called prime numbers. I'm sorry, what prime kind? Numbers. What kind of a role you assigned to prime numbers who oh, well, in your book? That yeah, was. that was in the novel. I did have prime numbers and they were kind of uh, very uh, proud of their status. And you know, the other numbers were kind of uh, you know, subservient to them. So there's a whole bunch of escapades. And it looks like our time is up, but uh, yeah. maybe and just really quick, what's next for you? Oh, so next thing, the, what I'm working on is a memoir based on uh, about two to 3,000 letters that I wrote home to my mother and she kept and gave to me. So I have to work on that. So that's the next project. And then after that, you can write some more math books. I can write some math books. But <laughs> one thing I do want to say is uh, I do want to thank JLF in particular for, um, for their support of math. You know, I, I remember in 2013 in Jaipur, you had a session on Ramanujan. And that was the first. And you've had other mathematicians. And you've been very generous with uh, having math books, my book and other books. So a big uh, shout out to JLF for doing that. that that's been great. Thank you. And the Asia Society, too, of course.